Hello, and welcome to Christ Community Church Online. My name is Jenna, and I'm so glad that you could tune in with us today. We would love to connect with you, so we invite you to go to the link in the description and fill out our Connect card online. Our vision here at Christ Community Church is to encounter, pursue, and live like Jesus. Our prayer for you today is that no matter what day of the week it is, or where you're watching this message from, that you truly encounter Him. So let's get started. Hey, good morning, Christ Community Church and guests, friends. If this is your first time, we're so glad that you're here. My name is Brad. I am the senior pastor here at Christ Community Church. And I just want to point your attention quickly. If you're a first-time guest or a recent first-time guest and haven't done this yet, uh, there's a card on the back of one of the seats nearby you uh, that says, this card's for you. It's a Connect card. If you want to fill that out, if you want to say, hey, here's my name. I was in church. We would love to know who you are and get to know you a little bit better, help you stay connected to things here at the church and different events and uh, things like that. So uh, if you fill that out, you can either give it to me directly or you can put it in the tithes and offerings box hanging in the cafe. And we would love the chance to get to know you today or any day, really. Uh, but happy Memorial Day weekend, as Jared said. I, uh, I hope this weekend you get a chance to celebrate. Um, celebrate what we have to be grateful for in this nation and uh, to celebrate with some loved ones, get some good food, whatever, sleep in tomorrow, whatever your thing is. I just hope it, it, it's, uh, it goes well and your time with family uh, is well spent or, or with loved ones. We're in a, a really fun series right now as a church family. I'm going to dive right into it this morning. It's called A New Way to Be Human. Um, I hope that piques your interest a little bit if this is your first time with us or if you've been with us for a few weeks. You know we've been kind of camped out here. We've been looking at Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It says that he sat down with a large crowd in front of him, and he kind of had this natural amphitheater type of, of situation going on where he was able to speak firmly, and they could hear his voice just carry down the hill. And he taught not from... Uh, a, a bunch of just head knowledge like many of our teachers do. It says at the end of Matthew 7, they were amazed because he taught with real authority. How many of you can tell the difference when somebody knows what they're talking about and when, and when they don't? Or, or how many of you can tell the difference when somebody's just trying to sell you something? Because it couldn't possibly be as good as what they're saying it is. You know what I'm saying? But if, if Jesus were to stand here in the flesh and speak to us like he did to this crowd on this, uh, you know, opportunity, this moment where the disciples were, were listening intently at what Jesus said, you would have had the kind of experience you have sometimes when you're listening to someone who truly cares, truly loves what they're talking about, but actually it would have been unique to anything else you've ever heard because no one has the kind of authority that Jesus has to speak on behalf of humanity, to speak on behalf of what it means to live this human life. And I would say to live it to the full, to live it in a healthy way, to, to go through all the obstacles and heartache and pain and struggles and joys and victories and celebrations with a healthy heart, mind, and soul. And that's what Jesus is going to talk to us about. And the way we've kind of coined this phrase during the series, I, it's been really sticking with me, I hope it sticks with you too, is that what Jesus is inviting us to here is that what filled his life could fill your life. What filled him up could fill you up. It's the invitation he gives us in the Sermon on the Mount. And if you are hungry to hear what God has to say to you from the words of Jesus, from Matthew chapter 6 today, would you just say amen? And let's, let's pray together. Come on, let me hear you. Amen, amen. I'm ready to hear the word of God. Let's pray. God, make us hungry for your word. It was your son Jesus himself who said, man does not live by bread alone. We need more than bread this morning. We need a spiritual meal. We need spiritual bread. Jesus would go on to say, he is the bread of heaven who's come down. And so we want to receive everything he has for us this morning. Would you make our hearts hungry and make our, our lives hungry? healthy soil for the seed of your word to be planted so that it can grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, it was kind of funny this last week because I've been thinking about Lance Armstrong. 
um, not the stretchy figurine from when you were little, Lance Armstrong, the cyclist. Uh, you guys remember this guy? Um, it's funny because he, he popped up, uh, he was doing some CrossFit workout with this guy that I follow, and they're like, oh, Lance Armstrong still got it. And I was like, yeah, I was kind of young when all the Lance Armstrong stuff went down. And so it piqued my curiosity. I kind of went back. Some of you will remember this more vividly than others, but uh, I find it a very interesting tale that Lance, Arm Ar Lance Armstrong, a former racing cyclist, helped elevate cycling to global popularity. Throughout his career, though, he was consistently um, accused of doping. In, in the sports world, that means he was, he was accused of taking illegal drugs that would give him an, a performance edge over the competition. Illegal in his sport, or maybe just in some cases, plain old illegal period. Um, and he, he kept just arguing, no, 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 no. Um, his, his career kind of got off to an uneven start in 1996. He had a few wins and a few embarrassing losses. In fact, uh, Lance Armstrong's first Tour de France, he, he didn't even finish the first Tour de France. He had to withdraw from the race, but he had a few wins. He was starting to gain some popularity. He was invited to the 1996 Olympics where he had a lackluster performance and later that year in October was diagnosed with advanced testicular cancer, which had spread to his lymph nodes, lungs, brain, and abdomen. He was quoted in saying this, I intend to beat this disease, and further, I intend to ride again as a professional cyclist. He announced his diagnosis, began chemotherapy, which ended in December of 1996. Just two years later, sorry, just two years after returning to his sport, in 1999 at age 27, Armstrong competed in and won his first Tour de France race. He said, I hope it sends out a fantastic message to all survivors around the world. He's saying this at the finish line in Paris. That we can return to what we were before and even better, he says. He's immediately peppered with questions about doping, denying accusations, despite testing positive for performance-enhancing drugs in his bloodstream. He shows a backdated prescription to avoid sanctions. And honestly, at that time, the questions really didn't matter. The world was so in love with the comeback story. And his, the victory at Tour de France launches Armstrong into global stardom. Armstrong would go on to seven consecutive Tour de France victories from 1999 to 2005. He established the Livestrong Foundation to support cancer patients and research and became a global spokesperson for cancer survivors and a major U.S. celebrity. In 2005, at age 33, after winning his seventh Tour de France, he retired and, it, and a French newspaper that same year reported blood samples retested from a 1999 race show evidence of performance enhancing drugs. Armstrong is quoted by CNN by saying this, if you consider my situation, a guy who comes back from arguably a death sentence, why would I then enter into a sport, dope myself, and risk my life again? That's crazy. I would never do that. No, no way, he says. After a brief attempt to return from retirement, and by then many of his former teammates coming out confessing they had, taking performance enhancing drugs. In fact, some of them saying they got their drugs from Armstrong himself. Cracks began to form in this story, this perfect story he had been telling that had kept him safe. Finally, in 2013, in a January interview with Oprah Winfrey, because if you're going to confess, you might as well make it big on Oprah, I guess. Armstrong finally admitted to doping every single, not one year, not two years, not after a few wins, when he was worried, he would slip. Every single year that he won the Tour de France, he was doping and lying about it. He said, this story was so perfect for so long. It's this myth, this perfect story, and it wasn't true. Finally, he looked in the camera and told the truth, and Armstrong went from this global celebrity to, honestly, just another liar, just another lying dude, he cared more about the external success he was having than his internal integrity. He cared more about the public eye than what we'll call the secret place today. But you don't have to live like this. You don't have to hide and lie and cheat. You don't have to be so focused on, 
on what other people think about you or, or the success that you're willing to do anything it takes to achieve. You don't have to live like that. There's another way to prioritize life properly and not just value the outward appearance, but actually prioritize the inward stability of a healthy heart, healthy soul, healthy mind. And that, my friends, is exactly what I want to talk about today that Jesus teaches us in his Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be in Conduct Week 3. Another name for this could be The Secret Place because that's what Jesus is going to talk to us about. And I'm sorry there's a typo up here. It's actually Matthew 6, 1 through 8. That's my bad. I make these slides. It's not on anybody else. It's my fault. Okay. It's almost like I did. No, I didn't do this on purpose so that I could stand out in, in contrast from Lance Armstrong. Okay. But I did just tell you the truth to your face. Okay. I didn't do that on purpose. I try really hard to make these slides perfect. See, in our generation and time, because of TV and internet and social media, all of life is being valued and evaluated by the external, the outward, you know, the views, the shares, the likes, the subscriptions. Um, one way to say it is what's trending about our lives has become more valuable than what's true about our lives. It's not necessarily what's true. It's just what I can convince you of, at least for a little while, about me. It's not necessarily that I want to show you everything about my life. I just want to show you what I wish was true all the time in this little 30-second clip, right? Now, the internet is new, but the root, human, the root human problem here is ancient. And it just comes from uh, this place that we're addicted to the praise and approval of others. Humanity is addicted to the praise and approval of other people. The public eye, the public opinion... But in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is going to talk to us about a different way, a, a different way to consider, a new way to be human. We'll read it in just a second, but, but it's what Jesus calls the secret place, the individual personal experience every human being has with God, whether you realize it, believe in it, admit it or not. That God is watching you at a level that no one else can see. And that even when you're doing your best job, or like Lance Armstrong, you've got a perfect cover-up story, even in that moment, God sees all. And he sees everything. And he hears every thought. And every word on your mind or, or on your heart is before him. 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord's taking the prophet Samuel to school in this moment. He says, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. Or maybe we could revisit Psalm 139. We were, we were in Psalm 139 last week. Remember, it's the one where it's this beautiful poetic language, and then all of a sudden it's like, don't I hate those who hate you, right? But the beautiful poetic language here is, Lord, you search me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts even from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You're aware of all my ways. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, all. The Lord is aware of all your ways. The psalmist continues in verse 4, Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. God, how precious your thoughts are to me, how vast their sum is. If I counted them, they, will, they would outnumber the grains of sand. Scripture is teaching us that there is a more important side to life that often gets ignored and neglected. We spend so much time looking at the outward and the exterior, but the Scripture is teaching us there is an interior. There is an inner part. There is a hidden part. There is a secret place in your life, and that is the place that God values. Dallas Willard, in his book, Renovation of the Heart, Brilliant man. He said, the part of us that drives and organizes our life is not the physical, not the outward, not the external. That spiritual place within us has been formed by a world away from God. Now it must be transformed. And we got this on the screens for you this morning. The revolution of Jesus is a revolution of the human heart. See, Jesus understands that He doesn't have to address the outward 
or the exterior or the behavior or the words, because if he can address your heart, that's where all of those things come from. And so he says, Let's not worry about what the world says. See, the world around us, the culture of celebrity, fame, and success at all costs has it backwards. They would say to you this morning, if you can achieve by whatever means possible, just don't hurt anybody else, but even if you have to lie a little bit or cheat a little bit, whatever, if you can achieve the fame and success that you're after, then finally the doubts and insecurities you have on the inside will then be satisfied. But we've seen all the documentaries. We know that some of the most famous, some of the most rich, most well-known, most successful people were some of the most still, at that point, broken people on the planet. No, Jesus wants to flip that script around for us. And when you focus on what God values in the interior of your life, everything else outside will fall into its healthy and rightful place. And if you feel like it, you could say amen at any point today. If you want to agree with the word of God and your pastor, that would be really fun. Let's finally get to our text this morning. We're going to read Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 1, verse 1 through 8, if you want to read along with me or you can listen. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 5, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then pray then like this. We'll get to next week. Oswald Chambers says of this section of Scripture that the main idea is to keep your eyes on God, not on people. I know that's incredibly simple, right? It sounds so simple. Your eyes on God, not on people. And how difficult it is to actually live that out, right? This is a a gut check moment for the church every time a believer reads this section of Scripture and asks the question, why do I do the things that I do? In this section, Jesus is drawing special attention to giving to the poor and prayer. And and for Jesus, prayer was not an activity that you just did in, in solemn moments. Prayer was not just before you ate. Prayer was not just... At a, at a religious service or ceremony, prayer was a lifestyle. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. But for us this morning, we've got to really have this gut check moment as a church. Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we give? Why do we pray? Why do we sing? Why do we attend church? Why do we volunteer? Why, why do we do all of this? Why do I feel pressure at home to read my Bible and to pray? Because my pastor just keeps yelling at me on Sunday, telling me I should do this more. And so when I go home, I'm like, gosh, I want to just, you know, chill. But I feel like maybe I should do this instead. But why? Why is, is a hugely important question. You know, all of of these kind of major Christian activities, if you want to call them that, that we have our roots in Judaism because Jesus was Jewish. Jesus entered the world in a Jewish culture, Jewish, um, you know, place in the world. And and so he's in the context of of a culture that values religious activity. So so for us this morning in post-Christian America, we're kind of like, Well, if I wanted to get fans, I wouldn't do it by standing on the street corner praying out loud, right? You know, if if I wanted people to like me, I I wouldn't exactly 
uh, do it that way. But Jesus is focusing on this parade of life that they have created in their culture. Parade. Is, is parade the word I'm looking for? Or charade, maybe? I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of a toss-up between the two, right? <laughs> Anywhere where I'm pretending to be something that I'm not to impress somebody else. Anywhere where I don't actually care about the words that I'm saying, let's say in prayer before the Lord. Pastor Brad just asked me to pray, you know, at this moment or before this thing. And so I just, I'm standing in front of a bunch of people. I just wanted to pray in a way that would impress them and make them, you know, convince them that I'm super spiritual. God's like, yeah, I'm not really into that. That's not really my thing. We still care too much about what people think of us and far too little about what God thinks. We need this gut check because in order to become more like Jesus, we need a shift, a major shift, a transformation of the heart, as Dallas Willard called it. In order for us to get to the place where Jesus was in John chapter 5, I just want to load you up with this because this would be really, really awesome for you to say to somebody at some point. In John chapter 5, uh, Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees because he knows he's the Son of God. And they're like, how dare you call yourself the Son of God? And in verse 41, Jesus says this, your approval means nothing to me. Woo! When was the last time you said that to somebody? Probably not in the right spirit when you said it. <laughs> Somebody said amen in the back. <laughs> Jesus said, your approval means nothing to me because I, I know you don't have God's love in your heart. Can I paraphrase this for you this morning? Why should I care what you think when you don't care what God thinks? Why should I bother myself with performing the way you want me to perform, Pharisees, when you don't have God's value in your life, what's truly valuable in your life. Why, why should your approval mean anything to me? He goes on in verse 44. We've got part of this on the screens for you. No wonder you can't believe. Ooh, wow. For you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. What a statement. I, I don't know about you. Can we think of a verse that better defines the time we're living in? That better defines what's being talked about incessantly online, in the news? A value system that, that cares about the kind of honor we can give each other, but not the kind of honor that comes from the Lord. A value system that that wants the praise and approval of others and doesn't care about the praise or approval of God. The honor that, that God would give to speak over someone's life and go, thank you for standing up for this. Jesus says there is another way, though, to be human than what you've learned, what you've been taught, or as Dallas Willard said, the, the internal place of our lives that has been formed by a world far away from God. Jesus says, I want to show you another way. And it starts with the secret place. Let's read it again together. Bits and pieces of it and just kind of take our time. Matthew 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. That's the why. That's the gut check. Am I just doing this so someone else will see me and notice me and be impressed by me? You have no reward with your Father in heaven when you do it this way. So, whenever you give to the poor. Now, we got to make this very, very clear this morning. Jesus is not saying, so, do everything top secretly like a ninja or spy so that no one ever sees anything you ever do. Well, that wouldn't really line up with the whole of the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus already told us in one of our first weeks together, let your light shine before men, right? Jesus is not saying, don't ever do anything wherever people can see, you know, never be seen by people. No, no, no. What he's saying is, what's your why? What's your motivation? The outward still matters. It still matters that we give to the poor. It still matters that we pray. It still matters that we show up. But the why is what Jesus is after. He says, don't sound a trumpet. Sounds like a parade, right? Don't sound a trumpet as the hypocrites do to be applauded by people. 
But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees what you do secretly, because what you do secretly, you really believe and care about. Right? Like what you do when nobody's looking or if nobody cared, but you do it anyway, shows where your heart's really at. And whenever you pray, he says, don't be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues. And, and, and I just, I can hear you, I can hear your thoughts this morning. Well, guess what, pastor? I don't like praying out loud anyway, so this ain't for me. This message is for somebody else. I know you, I know you guys. Whatever you do to only be seen by people, whatever you change about yourself so that other people will applaud you, whatever you do that's not coming from a genuine, secret, private relationship with God where you're like, God, you just deserve this. You need to ask the question, well, why? Why? Why am I doing this? I don't know about you. When it comes to prayer, it's terrifying to think that I could pray in such a way where God would say, well, I'm not listening to you right now because that prayer wasn't for me. It was for someone else. Think about that. Jesus says, don't pray like these people who are praying to be heard by other people. Meaning, they actually, they're praying, they're saying my name, but they don't actually care if I hear this at all. They just want the people around them to hear it. So why would I listen to a prayer? That prayer is not for me. You know, you know how polite God is? <laughs> some of you are like, well, I don't know. I've read some crazy things about Moses and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you know God really doesn't want to show up where he's not wanted necessarily. <laughs> you know, God's not trying to twist your arm and force his way into your life. And if you are praying prayers that aren't actually for him, they're for somebody else, He's not trying to eavesdrop on that conversation. He's like, I'll I'll wait until you're actually saying something you want me to hear. No, when you pray, Jesus says, because remember, we're in conduct week three. We're talking about the conduct of a disciple. And Jesus doesn't say, if you pray. He says, when you pray, when you are talking to your father, Go into your private room, prayer closet. Go into a place where you can shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret. Um, I've been talking to the Lord a little bit about this and and kind of just whispering to him like, Lord, I don't want to give up any of our secrets this morning. But but I do want to share, you know what I mean? Like I don't want to give away the things that that I experience in the secret place and just use them in front of you all and be an absolute terrible example of this, you know, of like, check me out in the secret place, how great I am, right? But, but I will say this to you. When I go into this place that, that it is just for the Lord, one of the things I start with, because I know Jesus taught this in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things I start with is, God, I'm here and nobody else knows that I'm here and nobody else cares that I'm here. I'm here because you're here. And then I go on from there. And it just, it fixes my mind in the right place that I'm not here to answer somebody else's call or expectation on my life. I'm not here doing this so that I can talk about it on Sunday. I'm here, Father, because you're here. Jesus says, shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret or in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Well, well, what's the reward of meeting with the father in the secret place? The father. He's the reward. Relationship with him. What you can get from him, you can get from no one else. That is the reward. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them because your father already knows the things that you need before you ask them. Now, uh, I love what Oswald Chambers says here, and this is actually just a good practice. So don't, don't hear this as a quote. Hear this as an actual direct question this morning. Stop for a moment and ask yourself, why do I pray? Go ahead. Let's close our eyes. Let's just have a private moment right now. Nobody else looking at anybody else. 
Oswald Chambers says, stop for a moment and ask, why do I pray? And if you want to add in, why do I give? Why do I attend? Why do I volunteer? Why do I sing on Sunday morning? Chambers continues, he says, what is my motive? Is it because I have a personal secret relationship to God known to no one but myself? All right, open your eyes and consider that question ongoing. You know, when you leave this place and you go home and you've got your next quiet moment and your choices are in this perfectly quiet moment, I can turn on the TV, turn on my phone, turn on music, turn on a thing and fill this silence with something else. Jesus says, if you fill the secret place with something else, then you've chosen your reward. But maybe in your next quiet moment, you might turn and said and go, well, Father, you're here. <laughs> maybe I'll spend a, a couple of minutes with you. See, Jesus is thankfully not the kind of leader who who just wants to tell you what he wants, you know, do as I say, not as I do. I, I don't know how many times I've said that to my kids, to people that work with me. Do as I say, not as I do. When I show up late, right after I ream somebody out for being late to a meeting, or you know what I mean? Or right after I've told the kids, like, don't lose your, your cool, you know? And I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Jesus is not a, a, a do as I say, not as I do kind of leader. He's not a uh, results-only focused leader in your life, like some of the bosses or coaches or things that you've had. And we know this because we can follow along in Scripture and see Jesus himself prioritized the secret place in his own life. Remember, this whole series is an invitation to let what filled his life fill your life. Well, Jesus prioritized the secret place. And how can we become more like Jesus if we don't do some of the things that he did, especially in private? Let me just lay this on you for a second. I've preached on this a little bit before, but it's just worth revisiting. Matthew 14, just a, a few, just a few of these scripture references. Matthew 14, 23, after he sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. Mark 1, 35. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went away to a secluded place, and was praying there. Luke 5, 16. He often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. It was at this time, Luke 6, 12. It was at this time he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Did you catch some of this right here? While the world is saying, gather the crowds and keep their attention as long as you can, Jesus is saying, please leave me alone for a little bit. I need to go be with my Father in the secret place. I love what John Mark Comer said. He, he was preaching on uh, this section of Scripture and, and the prayer, the, the um prayer that Jesus is going to lead his disciples in that we'll get into next week. But he says this, when you study the scriptures for Jesus of Nazareth, prayer was the center point of his life with God. It was woven into the fabric of his day-to-day -day existence, into his morning routine, into his weekly schedule. He made time for it even when he was really busy. For Jesus, prayer was even more important than sleep. Oh, Holy Spirit, come and confront us this morning. Ooh. Prayer, listen to me, listen to this. This is so important. John Mark Comer says this. Prayer doesn't seem like a drag to Jesus or a to-do to check off to get rid of guilt or shame. It seems like he really enjoyed the Father's company. How many of you would like to get to that kind of place with the Lord? Where prayer is not a drag, Prayer is not a to-do. Prayer is not something that your pastor is just nagging you to do and get here on first Wednesday so you can get yourself souped up for prayer in the secret place that, that month. Those are all, you know, fine, good things. But, but how many of you would like to get to the place where you're like, man, this is my spot. 
I've got a spot. I've got a place. I'm not going to tell you about it. It's between me and the Lord where I go and I shut the door or I go and I walk outside like Jesus did and there's not a soul there. Anybody, this is kind of off topic, but anybody ever just like want to go off into the wilderness far enough where you could scream and nobody would hear you? Not in a creepy way, but you know what I mean? Just just you've got some emotions kind of like pent up. And if you scream that way, even in your own house, even into a pillow, your kids might hear you and think you're nuts. Um, and you're like, I just have something. I, I just got to roar about something. I wish there was a place I could go and just like, Bruh! you know, and just let it all out before the Lord. I, it was a bunny trail, I know, but. But that kind of seclusion, deserted, private place where nobody else can hear you, nobody sees you, no fanfare. It's just you and the Father. Um, I, I just, I wonder how different our lives would be if we prioritize this a little more than we do. How different your faith would be if you met with the Father just a little more often in the, in the secret place. How different your attitude or mood would be how your maturity would look with a little more time spent. And I don't mean these as guilt trip statements, right? I just mean these as like, man, it's an invitation from Jesus that's right there in front of us that could change the interior of our life. And how many of you know, when, when you affect a tree at its roots, it shows forth on its branches. Jesus is saying, I want to get into the roots of your life. You can meet with the Father and, and get nourishment from, from the Father that only he can give and get it down in the roots of your life. How different would our church be if more of us were seeking the Lord in the secret place? How about this? How many less scandals would we have in the church today if we had leaders who, who enjoyed the Father's company as much as Jesus did? and enjoyed his company more than attendance numbers, views online, book sales. We desperately need this change and this transformation on the inside to stop valuing the outside so much and start valuing what God values on the inside in the secret place of our lives. So let's talk quickly if this whole series is an invitation to be filled with what filled Jesus, let's talk. How do we become filled with what filled Jesus's life and become a disciple and do what he did? Uh, number one, I would suggest to you this morning, we got to come clean. The first thing we got to do is come clean. Now, let me be very clear. Jesus never had to repent of anything, but you and I really, really, really do. <laughs> okay. So in order to get started in this revolution of our hearts, the first thing we need to do is admit we need that. The first thing we need to do is admit the ways that your life and my life don't line up with the life of Jesus. Clearly, in this compartment of my life, Jesus, I'm not filled with what filled you, and I need you, and I need what filled your life to come fill this part of me. Remember, Dallas Willard said that spiritual place within us that directs and drives our decisions, behaviors, and attitudes has been formed, at least up until the point where you give your life to Jesus, it was formed by a world away from God. Now it needs to be transformed. And the biblical word for that is repent. In fact, Jesus' message, the very message he preached was, it's time to repent because the kingdom of God, of God is near. Repent means not just confess, and we've talked a lot about that here. I think you know how I feel about uh, that subject, but, but not just confessing, not just saying sorry. Repentance actually means I, I pick up and move and change, and, and I believe something different. I believe something fundamentally different about that, that changes the way I think about it and therefore what I do about it. If you feel like You've got that in your life somewhere where you're being deceptive to, to the approval or praise of someone else. And it doesn't matter if it's true as long as they're convinced that it's true. As long as it's a trend in your life that someone else likes. If you feel like, gosh, I need a change and a transformation in that part of my life. It's the kindness of God and the fear of God that lead us to 
repentance. It's his kindness for sure that this is an invitation and not just a punishment in, in our lives. But there is also the, the fear of God, the terrifying nature that I could spend hours in prayer, but I'm just doing it for someone else to hear it and not the Lord. And that fear brings me to a place of humility and repentance. And repentance, here's the really good news, repentance, even though it really, really hurts at first, it actually leads us to cleansing and healing and a fresh start. And that's why I'm suggesting, number one, we need to come clean. In order to be filled with what filled Jesus, number one, we need to come clean. 1 John 1 verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And friends, what Jesus is inviting us to here, this, this flipping of the script, to, to not worry so much about the honor or praise or approval we get from other people, and to shift our attention to the secret place with the Father and the honor and approval we have with him as his child, is so much better than pretending and performing and parading. It's an awareness of God in your hiddenness, in your inner life, in your real character where you don't have to hide, you don't have to perform or put a mask on, you don't have to sneak around, he already knows. God wants to meet you and be with you where no one else's opinion is there to make you put on a mask. I really believe this statement. I don't know if I made it up or heard it, but um, it, you know, it's been in my mind for the last couple of years that you cannot be completely loved without first being completely known. And friends, I, I would tell you this morning, the place where you can be perfectly, completely known is in the secret place with the Father. Okay, number one, come clean. Start there. Number two, set aside the time. And this is where, this is where what, what I could never do, only Jesus can do at the cross, but then what I can do and make decisions for myself and take responsibility for my life collide in a beautiful way because Jesus has already made it possible for you to come boldly, blamelessly before God in his presence. But only you can choose whether or not you actually do that. <laughs> Listen to me. Nobody's going to make you go into the secret place. You go in there and you don't come out until, right? Like, no, nobody's going to twist your arm and say, have you gone in to be? What people are going to say is, did you do that thing I asked you to do yet that I need you to do? Did you go to the store yet? Did you go pick up the kids yet? Did you? They're going to ask you all of those things, but not, hardly anyone in your life is going to say, have you spent sufficient time with the Father this week? Wow. And, and no one is going to make that decision for you. No one can make that decision for you. John Mark Comer in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It's a good one, right, Heather? Heather's been sending me pictures like, I'm out in the garden reading my book. And, and it's, it's that book. Um, the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. He said, the number one problem you will face in trying to grow as a disciple of Jesus is time. Time. People are just too busy to live emotionally healthy and spiritually rich and vibrant lives. Now, Catch what he said. He didn't say it's, it's impossible, it's out of reach. No, he said it's in reach. People just won't choose it. They'll choose something else instead. The number one problem that will try to keep you away from the secret place is your own schedule. <laughs> your list of priorities. The pressures you feel, either from yourself or someone else, to go and perform and do, do whatever, it kind of makes sense why, why a lot of the references to Jesus in the secret place are while it was still dark in the early morning <laughs> or, or all night long while, while his disciples are asleep and not bothering him, he's spending time with the Father. Okay, number three, and this is the last one for us this morning, how to be filled with what filled Jesus' life. Choose your reward. Choose your reward. Jesus said, whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. They say they love 
uh, because they love to, to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people, they have their reward. They've chosen honor from man instead of honor from God. And you can make that same choice. In fact, it's yours to make, and no one can choose it for you. If you want the reward of being seen by people, you can have it. I don't know if they'll like what you do, but you can be seen by people. You can be visible to people. You can be out there and put your life out there and do your things and blab about whatever you want to. And Jesus said, if that's your choice, you've chosen your reward. Or you can have a private, deep well in a place where nobody else sees that you draw water from for the rest of your life when you are out in public and you go, I've got something for this. I've got a resource for this, but it comes from the secret place with the Father. This is the invitation of Jesus. It, if you show up in the secret place and give God your attention, he will reciprocate. That's what this Greek word says. The Greek word for reward here that Jesus uses is to give back and return. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said, if you seek the Father in the secret place, he will give back and return to you that time you spend with him, that attention you give him, that love you offer him. He will reciprocate. Would you stand with me as we get ready to close? I want to leave this final thought with you. And, um, and before I, I do, wow. Y'all are slow this morning. Okay. <laughs> it's like the progressive. Okay, never mind. Um, before I, I pray and close this morning, I want to invite Jared and May and the prophetic team to come up. Um, they're going to hang out right over here. If you would like to hear uh, a message from the Lord through our team, we believe in prophetic ministry. It's one of the gifts. Scripture says that God gives to his church to encourage and build up. That these guys pray, they will pray, they will listen, they will hear. They have made time in the secret place so that they can come out in public ministry and not worry about your approval, but the approval of God and deliver a message to you from God's heart to your heart. And in just a few minutes when we pray and close, you can come and, and uh, hang out with these guys. They'll greet you and tell you what's up. But let me leave you with this final thought. It's a quote from Leonard Ravenhill, who is... Uh, just a, a crazy good read. Any of the books he's, he's written, I, I would encourage you to read it. But this is from his book, Why Revival Tarries. He said this, if you have the smile of God, what does it matter if you have the frown of men? I just wanna say that one more time over you before we go together. If you have the smile of God, what does it matter if you have the frown of man? Jesus said to the Pharisees, you don't have the love of God on you. Why should I care what you think about me? I already know what the Father thinks about me is where that was coming from, right? Close your eyes. Let's, let's pray together. God, I'm asking for my friends this morning gathered here for church on a holiday weekend. They could be sleeping in. They could have been having brunch. They could have been doing a bunch of other things, but they gathered here, and I believe because they're hungry for you. Lord, I, I just, I believe there are some people here not prioritizing the secret place because they don't yet know or they're not convinced of your smile over them. Holy Spirit, that's not something I can reveal. That's not something I can convince them of. Spirit of God, would you come in the room right now in these precious final moments together. Would you remind us from your word? Would you remind us from the cross of Jesus Christ? Would you remind us from, from the faithfulness that you've shown us in our lives, the provision in all of these ways, God? Would you show us your smile this morning? Lord, we know the scriptures say, that now for, for any who believes in your son, who believes that he is your son, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, that now when you look at us, you don't see our sin, you don't see our past, you see the righteousness that only comes from the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us on the cross. 
And the scripture tells us the intention of that blood was so that Jesus could be the firstborn of many children, the adoption of many, many, many children. Father, would you show us your smile over the finished work of your son? Would you show us this morning and remind us and convince us, God, of your smile, that we'd be drawn into the secret place, that we'd enjoy your company, Father, the way that Jesus did, and that it would do something to the interior of our lives. They would shift us, shift our hunger, shift our appetites from the applause of people to the honor that only you can give, the reward that we can only find when we spend time with you. Holy Spirit, come and do that work. Lead us to this truth. Lead us to this conviction. Lead my friends and lead us to the secret place where we can be with the Father. Lead us to be disciples of Jesus as we continue to read this Sermon on the Mount together. In Jesus' name.